Well, good morning again. It's good to see you, and uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. Uh, we're finishing up Romans 8 this morning. Uh, we'll be finishing in verses 31 through 39. Paul writes here, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, we've been looking at Romans chapter 8 and uh, it is one of the uh, greatest chapters in the Bible and has a number of, of wonderful promises. Uh, and uh, this morning we'll finish out with our last study of the Christian's Declaration of Freedom. Uh, we've been looking at that freedom that we have. Uh, Paul has described to us four spiritual freedoms that believers enjoy because of our union with Christ. Uh, we looked at first at the uh, believer's freedom from judgment. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Secondly, we saw the believer's freedom from defeat. There's no obligation to live after the flesh any longer. Uh, thirdly, we saw the believer's freedom from discouragement. There's no frustration in our suffering because of the promised eternal future we have. And so today, we're going to see the last of those, and that is the believer's freedom from fear. There's no separation from God because we are eternally secure in our salvation. Uh, and so uh, that's the, uh, the main thrust of the subject here this morning, is that matter of eternal security. Uh, the Spirit of God makes the love of God real to us. Uh, the Father is for us, the Son is for us, and the Spirit is for us, and so nothing can separate us from His love. And so there, uh, you know, there is no reason for us to be uh, where we should not be more than conquerors, and we are more than conquerors. Uh, Paul says in verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? Uh, so Paul is going to ask a series of uh, four rhetorical questions uh, that, that are concerned with the eternal purposes of God. And uh, in essence, the uh, verse there, verse 31, is the conclusion that Paul draws to the first eight chapters of the book of Romans. Everything has been leading up to this point. Paul's response is that he has complete assurance that the eternal purposes of God will come to fruition because God is God. Uh, who can be against us, he asks. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have no adversaries, because we certainly do have adversaries that are listed in verses 35 and 36. But the strength of the adversaries uh, sinks into insignificance when we compare that with the power of God and the strength of God uh, who dwells within us. And so Paul is saying that there's no adversary that's too great to thwart the eternal purposes of God. If omnipotence is working on our behalf, then no lesser powers can defeat his program. And if the efforts of our adversaries, uh, since they're under his absolute control, uh, then they, they really serve only his purposes for us. And uh, nothing can happen to us that's not beyond the control of God. And so of all the promises that we have um, made to the child of God related to our salvation, uh, this is one of the most precious, that those who are saved by grace are saved forever. Uh, and that is what we call the doctrine of eternal security. Uh, and some will take various passages of scripture uh, and, and try to string them together and, and prove that a person can be saved today, but then lose their salvation tomorrow. But why would you want to do that? Why not just let the Bible say what it says and rejoice in the fact that we've been saved and we will always be saved? Uh, if we've been saved, we will always be saved. Uh, and that is really is the one thing that sets Christianity apart from 
other belief systems in the world today. Uh, the the uh, other belief systems of the world are, are based, first of all, on works, uh, and as a result of them being based on works, uh, if we fail to do the works, then we can lose our salvation. And that's the difference between Christianity and all these other belief systems, is that uh, the plan of salvation uh, that the Bible gives us guarantees absolute eternal security to everyone who's saved. Because it's not dependent on us. Our works have nothing to do with our salvation. Uh, it is wholly dependent on God. And so, uh, as a result, since God is the one who uh, is powerful enough to save us, he's powerful enough to keep us saved. And so that's what these verses are, are really all about. Uh, and there are a number of other passages in Scripture that uh, speak of this matter of eternal security. But even if we didn't have those, Romans 8 would be sufficient uh, to make it clear uh, that we are eternally secure. And so as we uh, bring our study uh, of chapter 8 to a close, uh, we're going to see that the Bible teaches that once we are saved, we are indeed secure for all of eternity. And so as believers, we have freedom from fear. There's no separation. Uh, we are secured by three things. First of all, we are secured by the labor of Christ. Secured by the labor of Christ. In verse 31, uh, again says, What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? And so, uh, the labor uh, of Christ is because of his interest in us, first of all. Uh, if all that we had were the first few chapters of the book of Romans then some might believe that God was against us. Because if you look at the beginning of the book of Romans, what does Paul do? He lays out the case for a sinful man in Romans chapter 1, uh, all the way through uh, the third chapter. Uh, he lays out the case that uh, we are all sinners and no one uh, is uh, able to be saved on their own merit. Uh, and then uh, he does speak of justification uh, but then he goes on and, and he talks about the struggle that we have in uh, chapters 6 and 7 with the sin nature. And so uh, it would seem, just by reading that, that God is against us. But in fact, uh, Paul uh, shows the length that God went to save man from his wrath and equip him for victory over sin and death. Uh, because uh, even though he built out this, this case of how bad humanity was, uh, he, he makes it clear uh, what God has done for us as well. And so, who can doubt that God is for us? Uh, you know, there are many people who believe in the eternal security of the believer, but they don't know why they believe it. Uh, do we know why we believe in eternal security? Do we understand all the implications of that? Uh, that's the question for this morning. Well, what is the basis for our assurance? Uh, are we assured our salvation because of our faith or because we made a decision? Is that what brings us assurance? Uh, if that's the case, what if we lose faith? Uh, what if we change our minds? Uh, then the basis for that assurance would be gone. Uh, <clears throat> shouldn't it be assumed that if God saves us because of our faith, then if we lose faith, we would also lose salvation? That's the only logical conclusion. If uh, that faith is the basis of the assurance. So, uh, if you look at it, it it's not, um, assurance doesn't begin with our faith, which, of course, that's important. Our faith is important, not to say it's not important, but uh, assurance begins with God's love for his elect. That's the basis for our assurance, is, uh, is God himself and the love he has for his elect. And so when you have that as the basis, uh, then... You know, when we get into those bad times where we lose faith, or we get in those times where we change our minds or we struggle, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about uh, losing that assurance of our salvation because uh, it's based on God who doesn't change and uh, who is there in eternal. David, doesn't that get back into what we were discussing last week? That yes. <laughs> essentially, uh, essentially, God calls and that's that. Um, I mean, if we don't really have anything to say about it, if it's not our faith, if it's not our choice. Right, and, and that's the thing. It's, that's where you get into um, a deep discussion about election and foreknowledge and, and salvation because 
uh, it, it's the work of God. God is the one who gives us that faith. Uh, but um, at the same time, there is our, our, our free will is somehow involved there because the Bible is clear that we have the free will. And so, you know, reconciling those two is something that people have been trying to do for centuries. Uh, and I, I don't think we'll ever be able to reconcile it on this side of eternity. Uh, we will only understand it on the far side of eternity uh, once, once we get to heaven. But uh, we do know that God's word uh, tells us that uh, you know, it's the basis that God is the one who starts the work of salvation. He's the one who calls. He's the one who's chosen people. And uh, so when you look at the technicalities of it, he's the one that uh, makes us alive and gives us the faith that, so that we can choose and place our faith and trust in him. That's really the best way I can explain it because I, um, you know, I, I, I have the same struggle that scholars have had for centuries trying to reconcile the two because the Bible does speak to both sides. But it's like that illustration, I think, Dr. Criswell, uh, Doug mentioned Dr. Criswell gave me, but being in church, you see the door from two sides. Well, well being raised Baptist is basically, you know, it, it, if someone says they lose faith, well, they were never saved to start with. That's their argument. But right. that doesn't seem to fit this. No, um, I think people try to pass it off too glibly. Um, because as we've seen in Romans 6 and 7, we still have the sin nature that we struggle with. Mm -hmm. And so even believers are going to struggle, and they're going to fail sometimes. So just because a believer fails doesn't mean that they were never saved to begin with. Um, but we do have to look for fruit in their lives. Um, is there fruit of salvation in their lives? Have they been faithful to God? You know, uh, it, it's likely that they've just fallen into some sin and, and are, are um, you know, struggling with a particular sin. That doesn't necessarily mean they're not saved. Uh, it just means that they're struggling with something. But even Paul admits that he struggled, and uh, he hated the sin that he would commit. So, um, you know, believers still commit sin, um, and ultimately we can't, we don't know the heart, and, and we can't judge 100% whether somebody is saved or not saved. Uh, all we can do is look at the fruit in their life, and what is the fruit of their life indicating? Uh, does it indicate someone who is saved and is just struggling with sin, or does it indicate someone who never really understood salvation and never was saved to begin with? And uh, so that's something you have to kind of be, judge individually as well. So, but, uh, you know, the, the, the work of salvation is all on the side of God, uh, and God is the one who starts that work and who quickens us. And, um, and, promises that we are eternally secure in that salvation. So even if we do sin, uh, we are not going to lose that salvation. Uh, we'll be chastened by God. He's going to discipline his children. Uh, but we can never lose our salvation. That is eternally secure. Uh, because our salvation experience forever changes us and it places us in the family of God. God loved us before time began. Uh, even before he created the world. Uh, he formulated a plan to bring us to himself. Uh, he knew us in our sinful state, and yet he loved us anyway. And he made a way for us to be saved by his grace. And uh, so, you know, God knew going in and creating the world, he knew what was going to happen. He knew that sin was going into the world, and he knew that he would have to uh, uh, give his son as a sacrifice for those sins. And, uh, you know, we, in our human minds, we, we can't always comprehend that. But uh, God is, uh, you know, his ways are, are far greater than our ways. And uh, even knowing what he would have to do, uh, he still created the world and, and still went forward with the plan uh, that he had in place. And so he loved us before time began. And so one person plus God makes an unconquerable majority, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, think about this. Um, and a, a lot of this goes back to God's sovereignty, okay? Uh, and this ties in with the discussion we were having last week about election and foreknowledge and everything. It's all related to God's sovereignty. Uh, 
if you look back in verses 28 to 30, uh, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. And so, God is sovereign, and there's other passages in Scripture that speak of God's sovereignty. Sovereign means the one who's in control. A, a sovereign is the, the person who's in control of a particular territory or area or, or country or whatever it, it may be. And so, uh, God is sovereign over the universe. He is in control of the whole universe. And so, if God is sovereign in our salvation, then... Uh, if he's also sovereign in our sufferings, and if he causes all things to work together for our good, as Paul explained in the earlier verses here, if he's predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ, then how can anything work against us? If God's done all that, and if he's sovereign over all that, then how can anything work against us uh, at all? Uh, those who reject the sovereignty of God in salvation... Uh, you know, in other words, it's those who are on the Arminian side that we mentioned last week who, who focus on free will. Uh, those who reject the sovereignty of God and salvation uh, have a lot of explaining to do when it comes to his sovereignty in any other area uh, as well. Has God saved those he loves or hasn't he? Uh, if salvation is sort of up for grabs, uh, by anybody, uh, then maybe God is closing his eyes and crossing his fingers and hoping for just one more good decision. Uh, if he hasn't made up his mind yet, or if he's waiting to see what man will do, then how can he promise that our sufferings are for our good? Uh, what if we ultimately reject God and turn away from faith? Is it for our good that we, that we go to hell? Uh, if he isn't sovereign in our salvation, uh, and, he's sitting, and if he's sitting up in heaven hoping that all men uh, will just turn from sin and be saved, then that sort of negates the whole promise of this verse, doesn't it? Uh, because uh, it depends on God's sovereignty. God is the one who's in charge and in control of all this, and as a result, he can make that promise uh, that uh, you know he's going to work all things together for good, and furthermore, he is for us, and as sovereign, if he's for us, then nobody can be against us. Uh, nobody has a hope of going against the sovereign God. Uh, and so, uh, <clears throat> God is sovereign in all things, and uh, his sovereignty and salvation uh, affects the whole uh, idea of the eternal security as well. All right, so we are secured by the labor of Christ because of his interest in us, and then secondly, uh, because of his investment in us. In uh, verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he also not with him freely give us all things? And so, uh, God has invested in us. Because God loves sinners so much, he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and pay the penalty for our sins. Uh, and so, <clears throat> when Jesus died... He became sin for us, and he was judged in our place. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5.21, and if I can have someone read that for me, please. Uh, so, when Jesus died, he became sin for us and was judged in our place, as Paul says here. No, I'm not sure. Okay. He made him who did no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay, thank you. So, he made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. Uh, so, Jesus uh, was made sin for us. And uh, so, God made the ultimate investment in you and me. He laid down his life for those that he loved. And uh, he didn't spare his own son. In other words, God gave the very best that he could give. Uh, the one thing that he could give, his own son. Uh, and so surely that's a final guarantee that he loves us enough to supply all of our needs. When the world uh, of lost mankind needed to be saved by a sinless substitute, the great God of the universe did not hold back 
uh, his heart's best treasure. Instead, he gave the best that he had, and he was pleased to give him over uh, to a death of shame and loss on our behalf so that we could be saved and so that we could be uh, part of God's family. And so the provision of his life for ours was an investment in our salvation. Uh, when we receive the finished work of Jesus as the payment for our salvation, we also receive the dividend of the initial investment. And so those who are into investing understand, uh, you know, you put a little bit in and then you get dividends and returns back. And that's exactly what happened here. Uh, when we trusted Jesus to save us, his death became our death and his payment became our payment. And his blood washed away our sins. And uh, so when God looks at us, he looks at us through the blood of Jesus Christ. So he doesn't see uh, the sinful person that we were any longer. He sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And uh, so at that moment that happened, all of the books were balanced, and we were set free from the great debt of sin that we owed to the Lord. And we then were forever saved by grace. Look at uh, Colossians 2. 13 and 14. <clears throat> Colossians 2, 13 and 14. If somebody can read that, please. I read that one later. Okay. I'll, I'll let that Colossians 2, 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with you having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Okay, thank you. So uh, we see the books were balanced there, the transaction was made, and uh, all of the debt that we have, uh, that, that we had, the same debt that we had, uh, was uh, taken care of, uh, there at the cross. And so uh, God has invested that in us. And uh, then thirdly, we see uh, we are secured uh, by, uh, with Christ because of his intentions for us. Because of his intentions for us. Again in verse 32, uh, how would he not also with him freely give us all things? So this is an argument from the greater to the lesser. Uh, if when we were sinners, God gave us his best, now that we are God's children, will he not give us all that we need? So if he gave us that, that huge investment at the beginning, then don't you think he's going to give us everything else we need as well? Uh, which, uh, in comparison, the things that we need now are not nearly as much as, as what we needed at the beginning for salvation. And so, uh, if God loves us that much, then uh, so much that he would give us his son, then what would he withhold from us? Well, the answer is nothing. He, wouldn't with, he would not withhold anything from us. Uh, he freely gives us all things. Uh, and so, uh, if God paid that high of a price to save us, then does he not plan to do something with us? Does he not have a plan for us? And the answer is, yes, he does. He's got a plan for each one of his children. Uh, to take us, ultimately, to take us uh, uh, to be with him uh, in heaven for all of eternity. But um, in this world, uh, his plan involves uh, a variety of things for every individual. You know, for some people, the plan is to uh, become a missionary. For some people, the plan is to become a pastor. For some people, uh, the plan is to uh, become a doctor. For some, it's uh, to just be a lay person and be faithful in the church. Uh, I mean, God's plan is different for everybody, uh, and uh, God's plan is always right. Uh, and so, uh, his, uh, he saved us, uh, and he could have just immediately taken us to heaven uh, when he saved us. But um, his ultimate plan was not just to take us to heaven, but to use us on this earth. And uh, so, we are to allow ourselves to be used and, and be faithful in serving him. Uh, and so uh, it's that argument from the lesser or from the greater to the lesser. Uh, Jesus, who's the greatest gift of all, ensures all the rest. And really, that uh, that intention uh, was the prayer of Jesus and was the plan of God. 
Uh, again, from the very beginning, you can see that in John 17, 24. Uh, God did not save us to lose us somewhere along the way. Uh, we are kept by his power. We are destined to be with him in heaven someday. And one proof of that is seen uh, in Ephesians 2 and verse 6. Ephesians 2 and verse 6. And if uh, someone can read that, please. Uh, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay. So, uh, if you look at the tense of there, uh, uh, the tense of the phrase phrases there, uh, he raised us with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that uh, is something that is done and complete. God sees it as complete. So, so God sees us as already being seated in the heavenly places with Christ. Uh, so we are already considered to be there right now. Uh, from God's perspective. And so, uh, if that's the case, then um, that would indicate that our, our salvation is secure and uh, that uh, we are going to be there and, and you know, God already sees us there. It's not like he's waiting for us to get to that point. He already sees us seated there. And so his intention uh, for each of us is to bring us home to glory and nothing will stop that from taking place. Uh, will be with him in that land. And if you continue in verse 7, please, uh, the Ephesians. All right. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Okay. Thank you. So uh, he sees us as already being seated in the heavenly places, and uh, he does this to, uh, you know, ultimately bring us to glory with him and we'll be with him uh, in that land. And so... Uh, his intention for us was uh, to save us and to take us to heaven to be with him for eternity. Uh, and so uh, we see the, uh, the work of Christ there. And then we see his, uh, it's because of his, of his insistence concerning us in verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. So again, who has the right to say that we are guilty before God? Uh, who is it that can accuse us? Uh, a lost world, uh, you know, the problem that we have is that the lost world sees those who claim to know Jesus, uh, but they see within us the characteristics and traits of our old lives of sin, because we still struggle with that sometimes. Uh, they see how we live, and they wonder how we can claim to be saved. Uh, and so certainly God's children ought to live lives that are different uh, from the world, and we ought to stand out from the world. That's what we are supposed to do. Uh, because the world is watching everything we do. However, Paul's point <clears throat> is that no one has the right to place anything on our account before the Lord. No one has the right to bring in a, a charge against us. <clears throat> Not even the devil himself has the right to accuse the redeemed of sin before the Lord. Because when we trusted Jesus for salvation, God justified us. That is, he declared us to be righteous. And so he took all of the sin that was on our account, and he transferred it to the account of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was paid for it permanently. And then he took the spotless righteousness of Christ and applied that to us. So that transaction happens in justification. And so on that basis, he declares us to be right with God. And so since we are right with God, nobody has... Uh, nobody can bring a charge against us because God sees us as righteous. Uh, Charles Spurgeon had this to say, uh, Every sin of the elect was laid upon the great champion of our salvation and by the atonement carried away. There is no sin in God's book against his people. They are justified in Christ forever. Uh, but unfortunately, there are times when we do not act like we're saved. And this kind of speaks to what you were asking about earlier. Uh, there are times where, where we don't act like we're saved. Uh, and, and if a lost person was watching our walk, uh, they might conclude that we are just as wicked as them. Uh, however, they cannot see the fact that a transaction did take place in heaven one day, and every child of God uh, is as righteous as he or she will ever be. That doesn't mean they're going to be perfect in this world, because nobody is perfect. Uh, there are some who teach the idea of sinless perfection, that we can become perfect in this world, but that's false. 
uh, the, the Romans 6, uh, you know, it's clear that we still have that old nature. Uh, and so uh, sometimes we don't act like uh, we are saved, uh, but uh, that doesn't change the fact that we are a child of God. You know, do your children always act the right way? Do they always act like you want them to act? No, they don't, right? But that doesn't change the fact that they're your child. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it just means that they need a good weapon and, and be brought back in, in, uh, in to the right path of, of uh, walking. Uh, and so the same is true in our lives. As children of God, uh, sometimes we don't act like children of God, uh, but that's when Jesus comes, or when God comes along and gives us uh, uh, some chastening and uh, brings us back onto the right track. But one day we have the promise that uh, this, this flesh uh, will be changed and, and our flesh will be eliminated and we'll be given new bodies and uh, that old nature will be removed and all we will have is that new nature within us and that we know uh, that new nature cannot sin and, and cannot turn against the Lord. And so uh, we do have that, uh, that promise of God and so we've got that security uh, even though uh, we may not always act the right way, uh, it doesn't change the fact that we're saved. Uh, it just means that we need to straighten up a little bit uh, uh, in, in this life. And so, <clears throat> we are secured by the labor of Jesus Christ. And then secondly, we are secured by the life of Christ. By the life of Christ. In verse 34, Paul writes, Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. And so uh, we are secured by the life of Christ because of the price that he paid on the cross. Uh, I mean, who has the right to condemn us? Because Jesus is the one who died for us. And, of course, the answer is nobody has a right to condemn us. Uh, Jesus' death on the cross took care of the sin debt of every person, as we, as we mentioned already. And so since he died and paid the price for our sin, no one else has the right or the power to judge us or to bring a charge against us because Jesus already paid for us. He is our master now. Uh, and so uh, he has delivered us from our offenses. And so uh, nobody else has the right or the authority to bring a charge against us. Now, uh, that isn't going to stop people from trying. Uh, and certainly the, the devil is always accusing the saints, uh, but uh, there's really no valid charge that he can bring because uh, the price has been paid already. And then also because of the power he displayed at the tomb. Uh, you know, three days after he died on the cross, Jesus Christ rose from the grave and he vacated the tomb forever, uh, and he lives forever. Uh, the death of the Lord Jesus on our behalf would accomplish very little if we did not, if it wasn't followed by the resurrection. And so, uh, not only did Jesus um, overcome sin, but he also overcame death, which is the result of sin. And uh, so, uh, the fact that he gives us hope for our future uh, also gives us an assurance of salvation. Because it lets us know that the same power that brought him back from the dead uh, was at work putting away our sins. And so it's brought us victory. We have victory over death, we have victory over guilt, and victory over sin. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've got victory uh, over any accusation uh, that anybody can bring against us. And so uh, it gives us that hope for the future and that assurance of salvation. And so no one has a right to judge the redeemed saint of God. Uh, and then also in the, in the life of Christ, uh, we, uh, uh, it's because of the position he holds at the throne. So we are secured by the life of Christ because uh, of the price he paid on the cross and because of the power he displayed at the tomb and because of the position at the throne. Because after his resurrection, uh, 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus ascended back into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. Uh, and the writer of Hebrews talks about this. And in ancient times, uh, to sit at the right hand of the king brought honor to that person, 
and gave that person participation in the royal power and governing of the people. And so today, it's the Lord Jesus Christ who sits at the right hand of God, and it is a position of dignity and power and authority, uh, a position that is his right as the one who's perfectly fulfilled the will of God and uh, has met the claims of divine righteousness. And so Jesus is our advocate. He's our representative uh, before the Father in heaven. Uh, an advocate is one who pleads the case of another uh, in a court of law. And so it's a, a lawyer uh, is an advocate. And so uh, Jesus Christ is our advocate. Uh, and in the courtroom of heaven, uh, you know, Satan is daily going to accuse the redeemed. Uh, he is constantly coming and saying, look what this person did. You know, look what David did. Look what Mike did. Look what Carl did. Look at, look at what Doug has been doing. Uh, Satan's going to accuse and, and accuse, but uh, Jesus, who's our advocate, he defends us before the Father. Uh, and he stands before the Father, and uh, he shows that his blood has been applied to our lives, and so the Father always dismisses the case because the, the crimes have been paid for. The law has been fulfilled, and so God uh, is a just God, and uh, he doesn't allow double jeopardy. And so we cannot be charged uh, for a crime that, that has already been taken care of. And so anytime Satan brings an accusation uh, then uh, against a, a child of God, it's dismissed because uh, it's been paid for already. And so when the world and the flesh and the devil try to accuse us uh, before the throne, we have one who stands in our place to defend us. And uh, again, that is Jesus Christ who is our advocate. And because he lives... No one has the right to accuse us before the throne of God or to judge the redeemed sinner. Uh, and so we've got that security there. All right, so we are secured by the labor of Christ. We are secured by the life of Christ. And finally, we are secured by the love of Christ. By the love of Christ. So God's love is an in, in enduring love. Verses 35 and 36, Paul writes, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And so, uh, God's love is an enduring love. Uh, and acknowledging the sovereignty of God in salvation frees us to rest in Jesus Christ. Because regardless of what we face as we go through life, uh, we know that nothing we face is able to come between us and the love of God. Uh, and so God's sovereignty uh, is, uh, is a freedom for us uh, because we know that um, nothing can come uh, between us and God. Uh, nothing we face uh, is going to be able to separate that relationship that we have. Uh, his love will endure through anything. Uh, and so... Uh, we have to be careful not to get caught up in things that happen uh, and feel that God has forsaken us. I mean, uh, the, the li life that we live here on this earth is not always easy. Sometimes there's loss. Sometimes there's pain. Uh, you know, we experience real tragedies. And so this is not to make light of tragedies. But it's the promise that in the midst of those tragedies, God is still there with us. He still has us. He still loves us. He has not forsaken us. He will always be there. And, you know, understanding God's sovereignty is a great comfort in those times of trial and difficulty and loss, uh, because God will always be there for us. And uh, he loves us, and uh, he's promised that he will be with us uh, all the way to the end. If you look at Hebrews 13 and verse 5, Uh, it says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. And so that's the, the, the last part of that verse is the, the promise that we have that. I will never desert you, nor forsake you. God will never leave us. Uh, he will never forsake us. Uh, no one is able to snatch a believer out of the Father's hand. Uh, because... Uh, he is the one that is holding us. His hand is mighty. It's the hand that created the world. 
and the hand that even now is sustaining the world. And so there's no power that can snatch a sheep from his grasp. Uh, and so uh, when, you, when you really think about eternal security, and those who believe you can lose your salvation, uh, what they're really saying is God is powerful enough to save you, but he's not powerful enough to keep you safe. That's really what it boils down to, is that they don't believe God is powerful enough to keep somebody safe. Uh, and so uh, that is uh, you know, an offense to the sovereignty of God, because God is powerful enough. If he's powerful enough to save us in the first place, why wouldn't he be powerful enough to keep us safe? Uh, and so uh, nobody is able to snatch a believer out of Christ's hand. Uh, once we are saved, then we are, are, are saved forever. And there's a promise that nothing will be able to come between us and the Lord. Uh, nothing will separate us uh, from the, uh, the power of God. Uh, and uh, that word separate is a strong word. Uh, it means, uh, it carries the idea of a divorce or dividing asunder. It's a, sort of a tearing something apart. Uh, but regardless of what happens in this life, nothing that man can do uh, can come between us and what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, again, he says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, will tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, will any of those separate us? And of course, it's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. Uh, no uh, suffering cannot separate us. Uh, we are going to experience suffering in this life. Uh, we live in a sin-cursed sin world, and uh, that, that uh, curse brings suffering with it. But that suffering cannot separate us from the love of God. And so God's love endures, and it makes us secure. And so not only is his love enduring, uh, his love is enabling. Verse 37 says, In all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loves us. We overwhelmingly conquer. Uh, so Paul uh, moves on to tell us that we are those overwhelming conquerors. Uh, we are super conquerors, so to speak, when we face the battles of this life because God lives within us and he enables us to stand in those times. And so a genuine believer uh, proves that he is real by, a real believer by the life that he lives. Uh, and uh, again, if the things of this world uh, can come between us and are living for God, then at that point we are probably not saved to begin with. Uh, but um, if these things come, they can never separate us uh, if we are a true believer. And so if a professing Christian can walk away from the things of God and live in persistent sin, uh, and, and we see that evidence and that fruit in their lives, that they are only interested in living in that persistent sin, uh, then that's when we say, you know, they didn't lose their salvation, they never had it to begin with. Uh, some people apply that too glibly. Uh, but, uh, again, it's a matter of, of looking at the big picture of a person's life and, and uh, looking at their daily walk. Uh, are they struggling with a sin, or are they just full on enjoying it? Uh, that, that's one way to tell if they're really truly saved or not. Uh, because true biblical salvation will produce an endurance in the saints of God. Uh, the theological term is the perseverance of the saints. Uh, and so a true child of God is enabled uh, by the prevailing love of God to carry on until he calls us home to glory. Uh, so we're going to weather storms of conflict, affliction, turmoil, persecution. Sometimes we're going to stumble and fall. But uh, we want to live for Jesus uh, we want to do the right thing, uh, we struggle when we sin, and so all of those things are a good sign that we have the real thing uh, with salvation. And so his love is enabling, and finally, his love is everlasting. And again, verses 38 and 39, uh, favorite verses for many. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Paul closes out this chapter uh, by speaking of his confidence in his own security 
and in the security of those who are redeemed. Uh, Christ gives eternal life to his sheep. Uh, eternal means forever. Uh, it's a life that will last forever. Uh, it's not a life that is conditional on the believer. In other words, uh, our eternal life is not conditioned on how good we are or whether we obey. Uh, it is an unconditional, eternal life that's given to us. Uh, and uh, it's not just something we hope for, uh, but it's something in which we can be confident. And so there's nothing uh, from the beginning of our life with God until the end of our life here that will ever be able to separate the believer from the salvation that he enjoys in Christ Jesus. And Paul gives a pretty comprehensive list. Uh, death, he says, neither death, life, angels, principalities, things present, things to come. So death or life, angels and principalities that would be spiritual forces, things present or things to come. So no matter what's happening now or whatever's going to happen in the future, uh, nor height, nor depth, and just in case I left anything out, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us. And so that's a pretty comprehensive list uh, that he gives. Uh, and so uh, just in case someone might still have a doubt, he throws in that any other created thing. Uh, because the point is that there is absolutely nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And that is the blessed confidence and assurance that we have as believers, that we uh, are uh, forever protected and secure. We don't have to fear losing our salvation. Uh, we may have to fear the chasing hand of God, but we don't have to fear losing our salvation, because uh, that can never happen. And so we have assurance of salvation, the conviction of believers, uh, for now and in the future, that they are in an unbreakable covenant fellowship with God. Uh, assurance of salvation or eternal security uh, is the central theme of biblical doctrine. And uh, it really is an offshoot of the faithfulness of God uh, and the inerrancy of the Bible as well uh, as the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. And so all of these things are tied together. Uh, and when everything is added up and, and all of these truths are digested, uh, then it becomes clear that in Jesus Christ we have absolute eternal security. Uh, we never need fear anything coming between us and God's salvation. Uh, if we are saved, we are saved forever. And so uh, we have uh, these verses of assurance in Hebrews 6.19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. Or uh, Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Uh, or as the psalmist says in uh, Psalm 4, 8. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And so uh, we have all of these promises. Uh, we have victory in Christ. Uh, and uh, we've got these, these uh, spiritual freedoms that Paul has uh, talked about uh, in this chapter. We're free from judgment, free from condemnation, uh, we're free from defeat, uh, free from discouragement uh, and suffering, and, and we're free uh, from separation because nothing can separate us from God. And so uh, those are the wonderful promises we have here in Romans, and that's why uh, the chapter is a, a favorite uh, of many people.